was an assembly in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. Fast forward 50 years, and I had the privilege of attending the commemorating service in downtown Phoenix with the, some of the original marchers in Washington and the breakfast that we had, it was good to hear some of the people that were there on that day 50 years ago. And I found it kind of ironic that the ceremony opened with the following scriptures. Turn with me over to Leviticus chapter 25. In Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 8. It says, And you shall number seven Sabbaths of years unto you, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of the years shall be unto you three, three unto you forty-nine years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement. You shall make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And at this time, at this breakfast, they had a gentleman who was Jewish come up and blow the shofar horn. Going on in verse, in verse uh, 10, it says, And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possessions, and you shall return every man unto his family. Going on in verse 11, a jubilee that shall that fiftieth year be unto you, and you shall sow neither reap nor which grow, which you grow, or of itself, nor gather in the grapes of your vineyard dressed. For it is a jubilee; it shall be holy unto you, and you shall eat the increase thereof of the field. In the year of the jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. And if you sell, you ought unto your neighbor, you shall buy aught and of your neighbor's hand, and you shall not oppress one another. And we're here, we're here in the midst of the holy day season, and we've just, the trumpets has just passed, and we're on our way to atonement, and then of course the Feast of, Feast of Tabernacles, and the last great day. Now we've had marvelous sermons now, and for those that weren't here. I see there's a lot of visitors. Welcome that's <laughs> at to Mr. Elliot and uh, the uh, other men that spoke, Mr. Tuck and, and Mr. Scriber and all the rest of them. They did a wonderful job laying out the plan of salvation that God has given to us. And you know this jubilee, the blowing of the trumpet on atonement, was a universal redemption for all mankind and slaves were declared free and every man was to return his possessions. And you know, it's ironic that, I, that this ceremony had these scriptures written or read at this time. And in 1963, Dr. King, he spoke of equality and freedom for the African Americans. But we know that all of mankind needs freedom. That freedom from Satan's influence, and from the sweltering heat of injustice, as Dr. King described it, having wronged every man, woman, and child on this planet, Earth, with his own perverted version of freedom. That's our adversary, Satan the devil. And you know, it's interesting in the sense that after they read the, or played the film of Dr. King's speech back in the original speech back in 1963. They called to the podium a Jew, a Muslim, a Sikh, and a Christian. Now this was an interfaith uh, gathering. But we know through the plan of salvation that there is but one way and one salvation. I have here a calendar of all the religious holy days of 2013. And there's probably over 150, 200 different days. But you and I, brethren, what's your name? Are blessed with the opportunity to know God's truth. 
And we know that God is not the author of confusion, as it says in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. He is the author of, he, it says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Rather than take advantage of what God's given you. The blessing of knowing God's plan is an incredible, absolutely wonderful blessing that a hundred, hundred fifty people in this congregation. Who knows how many congregations are meeting on this Sabbath day? But it's very few and far between. And you, as I quote Dr. Zimmerman, what's your name? You have this wonderful opportunity to be here with God's people and understand how the plan of salvation is going to work. Mr. Elliot went over it very well on the Feast of Trumpets. These holy days describe how different it's going to be in the future compared to what we are faced with now. And even though I, I brought up the Good News magazine, which has an extreme amount of good articles in regards to God's prophecy, and not only that, but looking towards the future, both what we have to go through in travail through the Feast of Trumpets and through, uh, through the, middle of the uh, tribulation, but also the goodness that's going to come. And that's what we focus in on. That's what we focus in on, that goodness. So, you know, when we see what lies ahead, it gives us pause. And we can be invigorated and excited not only do we have a wedding party here, but we have the holy days to celebrate together. And we're going to go over today to explore the lessons in contrast as to how the influence of how we think now versus the time when the influence of Satan and the harsh effects of this worldly way will come to an end. So today's title to the sermon today is A Lesson in Contrast. The transition from, time when we, from the time when we are influenced by our adversary, it will no longer be an option. For those who have lived through the tribulation as physical beings, it will be a stark contrast with the heavy, without the heavy influence that Satan lays upon us right now. And it's demoralizing effects. For those who have become members of the God family, can you imagine how invigorated, how excited, how much energy we're going to have, the boundless energy to do God's will. And the we will cease desiring our own will. Our world right now is engulfed in vanity, greed, lust, at all levels, in all facets of life. Imagine a time when all of your prayers will be for everyone except yourself. As a spirit being, again, with the Holy Spirit reverberating throughout our very being, directing us through our towards God, and every action as part of the God family will not be in want of our own selves, our own selfish desires, but God's will. A lesson in contrast. A distinct dif difference right now, what we're going, what we're faced with, we've seen and known nothing but the selfishness, the desires of self, the lust, the greed. And you know, throughout history, we've had many failures recorded and many triumphs. And throughout the Bible, we witness a common theme of overcoming. As Dr. King mentioned, we shall overcome. And he was looking towards a physical loosening. But we're looking for that spiritual loosening. That spiritual understanding to know that God is King of kings and Lord of lords. And his way and his will are the ultimate will for all of mankind. Christ's example of perfection as human beings with the scriptures of both Old and New Testament serve as our guidepost, our manual as to for what we are to become. 
to see God and to see how God would have us to see. We witness the disciples who become apostles and they strove to live that perfect life that Jesus Christ had laid out in his footsteps. That is where we're at right now. We are desiring God's will and God's way of life. It is a constant striving, probing deeper and deeper to root out all the carnal nature that we have, all the selfish desires, and understanding, as it says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, for the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? And as Mr. Elliot pointed out a few weeks ago, that's not to the Muslims, that's not to the Sikhs, that's not to, that's to you and me, brethren. That's to you and me. The heart is deceitful. And we have to know that we have to strive to be within God's realm to do the things that are pleasing unto him. As spirit beings, when we look forward to that time, we will have so deep of understanding of all that needs to happen to exist in perfect harmony with the God family and what it entails, the exactness of our attention to make this day, to make these days a reality. Again, these all lead up to the eighth day. The eighth day is what sends us to the next chapter. A chapter where, where God's will is done and Satan is gone. And as we look forward to the atonement, the at one with God, and we'll hear more about that in a, in, in a couple weeks, and in the next week, next Sabbath, it will happen. But we have to come to understand how merciful God is and how much grace he's imparted on us. Not the grace of this world, not the grace that the that we hear on television from some of these televangelists, a license to disobey, but a true grace, a true understanding of how we are to be according to God's will. Turn with me over to Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. It's exciting times, brethren. Exciting times. When I see beautiful young couples getting ready to launch their lives together, it's excitement right now. Smiles on their faces. They know. I was talking to Mr. Fenwick earlier, the younger Mr. Fenwick, and his wife's already over in the Philippines. And he's like, wow, I miss my wife. <laughs> I miss what she does for me. But he told me he has lots of paper plates, so he's like, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> In Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, it says, And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will make the stony heart of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, they, that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. It can't happen. It's hard to happen right now. We have to focus in on God because we have a we have an adversary that is trying so hard to keep us from doing what God's will is. We are in a time when we have to learn to have faith as a grain of a mustard seed to become a member of the God family. And we understand that it's through God, God's grace. But you know, throughout these days, it represents the complete emptying of ourselves, our own selfish desires, and being in one accord with the God of this universe. See, our lives are just a vapor. We've lost some saints. We've lost some loved ones. But we know that we look forward to, we desire the time. And it never goes away. My father died back in 1984. But I look forward to the day when I get to see him again. Having determined that no other will in this universe is as important, nor can be carried out without God's will being the primary driving factor in all that we do, all that we say, and what governs our actions. Fully taking on the mind of Christ and understanding so completely that no matter what, never 
Is our own personal will more important than God's will? Complete obedience with the understanding that our loving creator never has anything but the best intention for all his creation. All of his creation. God did everything according to, out of love for all of his creation. It is with this understanding that God is love and his preeminent actions and emotions that govern his thought process. We have to come to that same conclusion. When we think about things in terms of what we're going to do, is it governed by God's love? Is it governed by the thought process that would keep us from doing things that would harm others? The pureness and the oneness of the God family is paramount over any one being's will. We will be intertwined with the love and devotion to serve one another, to have that agape love with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our beings, so that we can reflect that holiness that God gives, that mirror image that God wants us to be. Because we know that the omnipotent God has given us the opportunity through his mercy to be a part of his family. In contrast, right now we're dealing with disharmony that surrounds us, that is a product of Satan, and we look forward to that time when he's put away. And the heavy burden of sin that we have right now, that will not take precedent over what we, what God desires of us, and that is being broadcast so heavily right now. Turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Excuse me, Ephesians 6 and verse 12. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Understanding that when that person cuts you off on the freeway or when that person says something at work that just really irks you, you know a lot, a lot of times that thought process comes from our adversary. Going on in verse 13, Wherefore we take unto the... the we take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. We get knocked down, brethren. But we know that with God's armor we can make it. Let's go on. Standing therefore having your loins girt about the truth and having the breastplate of righteousness. All of the characteristics that God would have us to have. And having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This, brethren, this book right here, has to be part of your everyday routine. The thought process. The mind that we have to have. The, let this mind be in you. And I'll speak of that later. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto the perseverance and the supplication of the saints. We are so heavily influenced by the unending call to gain and to get. And for those of you who have been around a long time, it's, it's, you know, remember Mr. Armstrong when he used to say, you know, there's a way, there's a way of give and there's a way of get. And we are so focused many times because we lose track sometimes of what we are here for. Why are you here? Not so you can gain all the toys and all the, all the possessions you can and then die rich. It's to give and to serve, to love, 
and to be that servant leadership and to be that person that's going to esteem others better than themselves, as it says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. If we stay focused on the world, you will get the world's results. And you know, we, that doesn't represent the agape love that God has for us and that we, were, we are supposed to have for one another. And as we'll hear on the upcoming Day of Atonement for those souls whose sole desire is to govern our souls, those who of us who are able to become spirit beings who God will allow into his family, the sole desire will be to be governed by the voice, the loving voice of this universe. A day when the vast greatness of God will be revealed and our enlightenment will be enhanced. We will be ever learning for eternity, but our ability to comprehend will be at its apex. So what does it mean? The disappearance of Satan. Turn with me over to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. A very familiar scripture. And we'll hear more about it again on the Day of Atonement. In Revelation 20 and verse 1 it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on that dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. What does it represent to not have Satan around? For one, you'll have truth. Right now, we get a lot of lies. No lies among spiritual beings. None. Zero. Zilch. A day where the vast greatness of God will be revealed and the enlightenment enhanced we will be with God in reverence of Him coming to understand His way. So much so that the kingdom, the realness of the kingdom will be according to everything that God wants done. We will not be hamstrung anymore by these physical human bodies. But we will be imbued with energy that allows us to serve mightily in all humbleness and grace. In contrast, the father of lies has at every opportunity lied to you, tried to cheat you, to manipulate you, and to destroy you. Go, over, go with me to over to John chapter 8 and verse 44. A very familiar scripture. But in John chapter 8 and verse 44, it says, you are of the father, you're the devil, and the lust of the father you will do. He is a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In 2 Corinthians, let's go over there, 2 Corinthians 11. That's what we're faced with now. Just a boatload of lies each and every day from all angles. Lies mixed with truth. Lies to deceive. Lies to keep you from being a part of God's, God's family. In 2 Corinthians verse 11, chapter 11, verse 14, it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing and if his ministers are also transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall become according to their works. There are so many people out there today that have no idea about God's holy days. And they call themselves Christians. Who? What days? What are you talking about? I've never heard of that. That happened to me this week. And it's amazing to think that somebody who goes to church all the time has not ever even heard of the Feast of Tabernacles or the Day of Atonement or the Feast of Trumpets. But we know that God has given us, he's been merciful to us. That's why I say take advantage of this opportunity. 
Don't poo-poo the idea of thinking that, look, this is real. This is our lives. Not just a part of it. Not just a little bit of it. But this is our lives. Everything else on top of that is what God will bless us with. But this, this book, this way of life, living a righteous way of life, is what we are to do. And what we will be doing if God is so merciful to grant us eternal life. So, again, what does the dis disappearance of Satan mean? We will have mercy. We will understand what is happening at this point because the physical history ends and our spiritual journey begins and we will have the minds open to the vast amount of mercy God has shown all of mankind through his plan of salvation. And we will be a part of it to do likewise. In contrast, Satan could have shown Jesus Christ when he was here on earth mercy and upset the apple, apple cart. But no, he was bent on Christ's destruction no matter what. And we know that there is no mercy in the satanic realm. Death and destruction are his very being. So there's no changing course for this being. There's no re repentance. Mercy and repentance are lost on our adversary. And we have to understand that. We have to understand that we are dealing with a ruthless killer. In contrast, we will be able to have true love. My wife was pointing out to me today, I was singing one of the old songs, and she's like, boy, you did, are you listening to the words you're singing? Those words are filled with selfishness. Shut up. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> and then I listened to it, and I'm like, you're right. Wow. How many times we don't listen to the, song, the words of the song? But we will learn to love like God loves, with all grace and all understanding. We will no longer be limited by the thoughts that cannot see a per past certain characteristics of a person that, a limit, that limit our ability to complete the agape love for all of mankind. In contrast, Satan does not know how to love, nor does he want anyone in the sat satanic realm to love. They don't know what love is. We witness through history the horrific acts of violence and war and what mankind can do to one another fueled by the God of this world so that he can destroy all of mankind. Our ability to understand how the plan of salvation ties together will be revealed to us so that we can teach others. And again, we have an eternity of learning to do. In contrast, it involves our understanding that every action will be fueled by love, mercy, goodness and of God. That in the stark contrast right now, where we're at with the heavy influence of Satan, it's hard. sometimes it becomes hard, it becomes hard to do. And when we are close to draw God, now as we're, when we draw closer to God through trial, through blessings, we understand and everything melts away. I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many people have had a few trials heading up to the feast? <laughs> we all have. But as we're closer to God, the closer we get to God, those melt away and they mean less and less. Why? Because we know that it is our job to stay focused on Him and to do his will, and to continue to serve no matter what. You know, in stark contrast, our earth, who we are and who we are to become, this planet, how tiny it is in this vast universe, one only has to look at the world from the outside to understand our, our problems are very, very small. I'm going to quote to you from Jim Lavelle, an astronaut who was on the Apollo 8 and the Apollo 13 missions and what he said when he was looking back from outer space back at the earth this earth 
is only a tiny planet in this vast universe when mankind has had the opportunity to leave the planet and view it from the outer space the perspective changes we learned a lot about the moon but what we really learned is about the earth the fact that just from the distance of the moon you cannot put your thumb you can put your thumb up and you can hide the earth behind your thumb everything that you have ever known your loved ones your business your problems of the earth itself all behind your thumb and how insignificant we really are but then how fortunate we are to have this body and to be able to enjoy the loving enjoy loving here amongst the beauty of the earth itself and that's Jim Lavelle also I'm going to quote uh, Frank Borman he was on the Apollo 8 mission it says the view of the earth from the moon fascinated me a small disk 240,000 miles away it was hard to think that this little thing held so many problems so many frustrations raging nationalistic interests famines wars pestilence that don't show that don't show from that distance you know brethren our God is great and he's bigger than what we can ever imagine and we will come to understand more and more through these through the God's holy day plan but again this is just a small brief time in history compared to what he has in store for us later on this year's feast of tabernacles is Philippians 2 5 let this mind be in you and I'm gonna go ahead and read that if you'll turn over to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 it says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation as we should not make ourselves of any reputation and look and took upon the form of a servant and was able to and made in the likeness of men we are men we should be servants to one another and to God's creation and being found in the fashion of a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in things in heaven and things on earth and the things under the earth so when I see this all these different religions it says here that every name will bow to Jesus Christ no matter what religion you are and every tongue in verse 11 should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God the Father as we focus in on God's words and we understand that God's way of life is what's coming we kind of forget about what how the, the trials that we have now mentally and spiritually we must be focused on the big picture and inculcate the vision of God's kingdom in the world tomorrow and what it represents so great a calling is before you right now brethren that to turn our backs on such a magnificent calling would be foolish what God has and what he resonates and how much he loves us and wants us to make it we have to grasp and know that he doesn't there's no there's no failure unless you decide to turn away he wants you to make it we look forward to a time that does not allow the in, does not have the influence of Satan we understand this harsh effects and how it's permeated this world so deeply right now and Godspeed that day so in conclusion brethren I mentioned to you at the beginning of the sermon about Dr. King and his speech in 1963 on August 28th he heralded a time when people would not judge them by the color of their skin but by the content of their character when the crooked places would be made straight when mankind would see all the glory of law God of the Lord in contrast the vision without the heavy influence of Satan 
the one who was responsible for keeping mankind from seeing the true grace, the wisdom, the mercy, the love that God Almighty has for all of his creation. When Satan is removed and a true jubilee is established, then and only then we can sing the songs of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we're free at last. <laughs>